Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to be back in San Sebastian from the U.S., from North Carolina. And I'm going to be talking about the U.S. system, which is not easy because we don't really have a system. Uh, we have workplace learning, and it's a very, very popular topic in the U.S. Uh, almost any plan to reform or improve education talks about workplace development, uh, work-based or workplace. And, and yet, we don't quite know how to do it. You know, the how, the when, the where, the how much are still question marks. Uh, we like it, we just don't quite know how. But the interest really took off in the late 80s and 90s when delegations from all over the U.S. were traveling to Europe to see how this worked. They were very, very impressed with the dual system. We had governors leading state delegations. We had the education writers of America going over. Uh, we had the chief state school officers, the head of all the state programs going over. Everybody was impressed when they came back. But then reality set, set in. Said, we don't have the right kind of culture, uh, business, or education. How are we going to do it? Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, our president had a TV show called The Apprentice a while back, so why don't we have it? But I have to assure you that wasn't the dual system, it wasn't apprenticeship, I'm not sure it was entertainment. But, uh... So first, I want to start with the U.S. context. And part of the problem is we don't have a national system of education. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that even mentions education or directs the states to do it. They've all done this independently on their own over a period of 70 or 80 years. Uh, so we have 50 different state systems and very, very little investment in career education or vocational education. And the same thing at the, at the two-year college level. Uh, we have 50 even more different state systems, some under universities, some under independent boards, some other state agencies. And then workforce development or um, workplace learning is split between the secondary schools in the U.S., which is grades 16, uh, ages 16 to 18, grades 10 to 12, and then the technical community colleges, which are considered post-secondary or colleges. And then to even confuse things more, the only official apprenticeship program in the U.S. is run by the U.S. Department of Labor for adults. And we have, we have a lack of national industry or labor infrastructure. We don't have national trade associations. We, we tried to create a national skill standards board. It was a terrible failure. We couldn't get agreement among our industries even to set skill standards. Uh, and then secondary career and technical education is shifting from historical separate tracks, which it had been for many years. Uh, we didn't call it the dual system, but you went into vocational or into college prep. It's now turning into an integrated curriculum with a little bit of each. And of course, federal funds, we don't have a lot, but what we have is moving away uh, from paying for the programs to basically improvement and accountability. And then, so as I said, we have this three-tiered structure or four-tiered structure. We have the, at the youth side, we have the high, it's in the public high schools. In the colleges, it's tuition-based. These are community colleges that, in some cases, transfer into universities. Then we have the Department of Labor. Then we have a lot of intermediaries in the U.S. that are funded by the government or by private foundations that run, help the schools run some kind of apprenticeship programs by making the connection between the businesses and the students and helping them organize it. So, but when the president is, or the Congress thinks we need more workforce development or workplace learning, they immediately look at the Department of Labor and some of that money gets into the schools but they begin with the Labor Department. So these are the barriers to the dual system in the U.S., the way you have it in Europe, that we have a, a poor national image of vocational education, and I heard some of that earlier, so I know it's somewhat of an issue in Europe, too. Um, and, of course, all the forecasts that say that 80% of the new jobs are going to require some kind of post-secondary education, even though a lot of the college graduates are taking jobs that don't require them. Uh, there's this sort of concern that that's what they need to get ahead. And in fact, there was a recent national survey by the um, U.S. Chambers of Commerce that said 63% of all business leaders believe a person needs a baccalaureate 
degree to achieve workforce success, only 18% said vocational education is important, and 14% said a, said a two-year college degree was important. And we already have overworked and over and underpaid teachers who are now being asked to try to take on the job of coordinating the apprenticeships or the workplace learning. Uh, a low industry willingness to invest in training uh, and mentoring because it's just not part of our culture. I think the, the, only, the bright spot there is we have so many new European companies coming into the U.S. who see this and understand the value and want it. And wherever there's success is, is really being driven by European-owned companies. And then there's still an emphasis on low slow skilled occupations and, uh, and not on the higher, higher growth occupations. And of course, low levels of basic skills and soft skills in the, in the schools, which makes it more difficult for, to make room for the vocational skills if they don't have the basic skills. And this is just an example of, shows you how many apprenticeships, apprentices there are based, data from the U.S. Department of Labor as a percent of our workforce compared to a few other companies, countries. So you can see it's not a lot. And we have, we have 500,000 apprentices registered in the U.S., 50,000 graduates, which sounds like a lot, but we would need six times that to equal the United Kingdom on a per capita basis and 16 times that to equal Germany. And this is where the U.S. Department of Labor apprentices are concentrated and see that 80% uh, are either in construction or military and of course you don't need a lot of skills to get into the military but they do a lot of training for the military they are going to be leaving but the and even manufacturing is, uh, is I think fairly low here but they don't put enough into the occupations that are growing Oops. And I think the biggest change that's occurring in the U.S. is trying to totally eliminate the word vocational. It's the, the Carl Perkins Act is the federal legislation that provides some funding for vocational education. It goes, dates back to 1917. And in 2006, the legislation totally eliminated the word vocational and replaced it with career and technical education. So CTE is now what we call it. And a lot of it is purely to, to change the image, just because it's had such a low image. And part of the, the reason for the low image uh, for many years is that the students from the lowest socioeconomic class were being tracked into the vocational programs, and parents knew that. And they didn't want their kids going into that. They wanted them to have some kind of an opportunity for, for more education. And the other thing it did is it, it directed the schools to integrate both academic, the academic and the vocational, the career and technical education, and to link it to post-secondary and make everything uh, the, with the purpose of either getting a job immediately or going to, to college, to post-secondary education. The other thing about our programs in the U.S. is that we have different levels of, I'm going to use the word CTE, but it was vocational education. The, there is a, the lowest level of just career awareness, which happens in the middle schools. And then there are CTE participants who just want to take one or two courses because they interest them. It could be anything from a manufacturing course to a graphic arts. Uh, and then there are the explorers who earn three or more credits, but not three in a single occupational area. And a, a CTE concentration in the secondary level is only three or more occupational credits. Uh, they can earn more in other occupational areas, but, but that's a fairly low level, and it's lower than it ever used to be because there's so much pressure to to get the students into more of the academic programs to make sure that they have the basic skills that employers say they want. They want people that know how to read, that can the teamwork, they're looking for. The, they need these soft skills uh, in order to do, learn the technical skills and the job skills. And if you look at the percentage of high school students in what we call a concentrated vocational education, now the OECD definition of concentration is five or six classes. 
So if you look at how many US students are in those compared to other countries, you can see how very, very low we are. And it's only like six out of a thousand of, of our students are in manufacturing programs, nine out of a thousand in health occupations, two out of a thousand in transportation, four out of a thousand in construction. Those are students that would be taking at least five courses in their concentration. These are the programs that we're split into. We have 16 career clusters, we call them, in these different areas. And each one of these career clusters is split into four to seven subclusters. Then within these subclusters, we have even more narrowly defined kinds of occupations. Um, logistics and invert, invert, inventory control, uh, quality insurance, production, uh, agricultural equipment or horticulture. These are the smaller sort of the uh, concentrations with each of these categories. But a student going into CTE has to choose one of these at some point and they generally have to go to their career counselor or something or, or somebody in the school that is supposed to know something about these. And the other thing is our career guidance system is oriented towards the academic courses and often doesn't really have a good sense of what the labor market is and what these careers are about. And that's especially true of the new and emerging occupations, uh, whether it's audio visual or the, uh, or the digital arts um, or even the newer, newer manufacturing occupations. So the, the forms are, are apprenticeship, what you would call apprenticeship or, or workplace learning take in the U.S. is we do have some apprenticeships in a few states in some limited fashion. And in the U.S. what happens is it's hard to develop a program and give it any broad-based exposure because our whole idea is let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, let's try a lot of different things and see what works. And part of the problem is that the organizations that fund CTE, uh, from outside, even the government agencies or the private foundations, will only fund things that are new and different and innovative. They don't want to fund anything that's already ongoing. So there's an incentive to try to keep changing and doing something a little bit different from what anybody else has done. But the credit-bearing uh, workplace learning, we do have some apprentices apprenticeships, we have cooperative education, uh, we have the internships, the cooperative education is generally something that uh, happens over a period of, of semesters, but the internships might be a one semester or a summer internship. Then we're more and more using simulated work environments within the schools, especially if you can't find the businesses that are willing to become involved, uh, turning more to the schools and creating so some kind of a, a, an environment, of a simulated business that are often run with support from the business sector. They'll come in and help advise the students. Then we have something called service learning where the students go out and get jobs in the community. Then we have a lot of embedded workplace learning where you have business-driven projects uh, with the companies that are advisory boards or the, the, the companies that the, uh, that the businesses get to, that the schools get to know will come in and create uh, you know, maybe a capstone program for, the, for a senior to take. And we have a lot of career-related occupations. One of the oldest workplace learning programs in the U.S. is in agriculture. We have something called the Future Farmers of America. And for 100 years, they've had to have a supervised occupational experience uh, over the summer where they had to actually have a job and keep a record of what they did or start a business and keep financial records of that business. And now there's, there's a lot of different organizations in different sectors of the economy that are doing this, these career-based or career-related competitions. We have school industry clubs and we have something called link learning, which is one of the most successful innovations in the U.S. It's uh, in California where they've created, created career academies uh, where the students basically link, they're linked to both the business and the community uh, in a certain cluster of the economy and they, and they have their, both the workplace experience and the academic and they bring them together and they're being prepared to get a job but the majority of them go on to post-secondary education. So this is part of what's also causing the problem with changing U.S. labor market conditions. There is a shift from manufacturing 
towards services. You know, when I moved to North Carolina, 34% of the workforce was involved in manufacturing in the 80s. Uh, today it's about 12%, which is well over the U.S. average. Only 8.5% of our, of our workforce is employed in manufacturing. We're still an industrial country, uh, country but it's very highly automated. And of those 8.5%, only about a half of those are in production jobs. And we're moving away from just making things to try to create experiences for people, which creates a whole other set of occupations in tourism, in the creative industries and creative occupations. We have a very quickly expanding contingent workforce in this whole gig economy, and I'll show you a slide in that in a minute. There's less company loyalty, people changing jobs more often, more changing career paths more frequently, and credentials. More and more employers are looking for creativity, soft skills. I did a um, survey of manufacturers in four states and asked them uh, whether they felt strongly about creative employees. And I defined creativity not as just solving problems, but in actually figuring out what the problems are and coming up with new ideas and new pr approaches. And 77% said they wanted the more artistic kind of creative employee, not just a problem solver. And the new jobs projected, you can see the 20 occupational categories for this 10-year period. Uh, they're in, they're in, six of the occupations are in healthcare, uh, three in personal services, you can see where they all are, two are laborers, three in ICT, but there's very few in the more traditional industries. The highest projection for new occupations are mostly in the service sectors. Oops, just turned it up. <laughs> and this is uh, something about how millennials feel about the workforce. And this really, I think, provides some uh, backup for the fact that's, that there's less loyalty that half of the millennials surveyed expect to work for two to five employees over the career, and a quarter expect to work for more than five. And there's a strong inclination for self-employment, wanting to have their own business. 70% um, said they're gonna own their business someday, and 27% already own their own business. So there's a big, there is a change in the attitudes of the millennials based on what, what people said 20 years ago. And this is, I said, contingent workforce. Between 2005 and 2015, there was, there was no net job gain in the U.S. in conventional employment. 100% of the employment was the contingent workforce. People, temporary workers, uh, freelancers, uh, self-employed, uh, contract workers, uh, a whole range of things. Uh, and you can see in, in industries like uh, it's especially big in construction. I mean, in North Carolina, the construction industry doesn't hire people anymore. They just want to contract with people so they don't have to pay any benefits and they don't have to worry about labor disputes. So they just hire people on a contract basis and that person has to look for his or her next job. And even manufacturing in this 10-year period has gone up for, from 2% or of the workforce to about 11 or 12% in the contingent workforce. More and more, even manufacturers want to hire temporary help and then they can kind of check them out and see who's good and who's not, uh, who can stay off drugs, who gets, time, uh, gets to work on time, and just be able to employ after they see what the employee is like. I'm going to give you just a few examples of actually what's, what's going on in the U.S. Uh, some of the places that are using apprenticeships because the Wisconsin, which is my home state, was the first state in the U.S. to actually enact law for a youth apprenticeship system. 1911, before we even had any federal legislation for vocational education. And they have a program that sounds not quite like the dual system, but it does require 450 hours of, uh, of work in the, in the company, uh, two semesters of classroom instruction, for level one and a little more for level two. And then they, they have a bridge to the U.S. Department of Labor Registered Program, but it's been a fairly a very successful program and there are no requirements to offer it. It's up to each school to do this independently. So some are actually doing this and some aren't. But uh, at least it's there, the money is available, which I think there's only one other state in the U.S. that has a state a state program for apprenticeships, that's South Carolina. 
but a lot of states have published guidelines on how to do it. They want their schools to try it. So there's probably been 15 or 20 states that have guidelines on, on different ways they can institute some form of workplace or work-based learning, uh, including the full apprenticeship. None go quite as far as, far as the dual system. Uh, the Career Academy at the secondary school is, I think, maybe the most promising approach in the U.S. These are becoming very popular. They started in uh, Philadelphia in 1969, mostly to deal with discrimination, with racial inequities. But now they're across the country, that in each state we have career academies that are small institutions around a certain industry cluster. They're smaller in scale than a full high school. They operate as a full learning uh, community and they totally integrate the basic technical and workplace learning within the single institution. So they have, they have people from the business community, from the education, from the, uh, from the social sector that come together and try to come up with a curriculum and uh, create partnerships with industry and make sure that there are meaningful apprenticeships or, or positions, learning positions, whether the co-ops or, or internships with industry. Uh, and it's got, again, they have a heavy equity focus, but California is going the farthest than this. They have a program called Link Learning with 500 institutions across the state. And this idea of a career academy is becoming more popular across the U.S. And shifting to workplace learning and post-secondary education, because this is where most of it is occurring now. Uh, and the advantage of doing this in what we call our community or technical colleges is that you get more mature students, average age of 27, 28. You have fewer legal barriers, barriers to, uh, to young people in the workforce, at least in the U.S. Uh, they are much more closely linked to business and industry and have been since they started, and they're very heavily involved in trying to recruit industry. Uh, more flexibility in what they can do and changes in the curriculum. They're not exactly higher ed and they're not controlled by the public school systems of the state. And it is a recognized educational credential. Now the disadvantage is that a large percentage of these students are employed part-time or full-time, which gives them less time to take a, uh, a, any kind of a, a work-based job or an internship or, or any form of a, an apprenticeship. And there is an increase in expectation to transfer to four-year colleges. These institutions began mostly for transfer they, when they were created as junior colleges 50, 70, 80 years ago. But in the 60s and 70s, they, they shifted totally into supporting industry and became more like technical and vocational schools, which is the way they are now. But now, because there's so much pressure again uh, on the college degree, because because there's so much uh, press on how much more you make with a college degree than without a college degree. And a lot of the, especially the, especially immigrant parents and uh, minority parents, they're the ones that are least likely to want their children to go into any kind of a career and technical education program. So there's this expectation, at least the option to transfer. Uh, one of the best programs is in South Carolina and this started a few years ago, and they are the, the most industrialized um, state in the U.S. right now, I think. And they also by, happen to have the highest proportion of European-owned businesses, and that's largely what's driving this, especially the area in northern South Carolina around Spartanburg and, Green, and Greenville. Uh, they had a textile industry that left, at, at, uh, went to Asia, but they had drawn all the machine builders from Switzerland and Austria and Germany, and they created this whole industrial machinery cluster to replace textiles, and those companies have remained, and they're the ones that really know the apprenticeship system. Uh, and they have 16 technical colleges that you can see is predominantly f uh, female and a very large minority, and they have a very strong emphasis on manufacturing, energy, and construction. And they also, and that's the only state where they manage the Department of Labor programs. You can see that they served uh, 6,500, almost 6,500 active apprenticeships, apprentices last year. And they have apprenticeship consultants to go out and help the schools make the connection. But I talked to a friend who's the president of the college there just three or four days ago. And he was emphasizing that even though they have the plan, it's very, very difficult to find companies that are willing to participate. They just don't want to put in what it takes 
uh, it's certainly not the money, but also the time that it takes to mentor and create a, an, a, an efficient uh, dual system that would actually help the students make their job a learning experience and not just putting in time, filling a position for the company. Uh, and they also don't want to invest in training themselves. Uh, the school found that only 23% of the companies in his region around Charlotte, around, around Charlotte North Carolina uh, invested in any kind of training. The German Chamber of Commerce is also very active in the U.S. right now, and they're turning this into an export business. Uh, and what they're doing is setting up offices in different regions of the country and creating a dual programs with specific companies, a company at a time. And they've been, they've been doing this mostly in the Midwest and the South. But right now they have about 60 companies in 13 states. They're all in these two regions. Over half the companies with apprentices are foreign owned. Uh, and they work mainly with the community and technical colleges so that they can get some and the educational degree at the same time. But they're moving very quickly to fill the gap that our government is leaving in the apprenticeship program and doing it through the private sector. And of course, in Germany, it is the Chamber of Commerce that runs the, the apprenticeship system. We also are using simulated workplaces. And just because it's so difficult to find the companies, there's a lot of examples of um, schools that are creating businesses, uh, both businesses and running them and employing people, but also school-based uh, enterprises where the students actually create a new business. Uh, in the state of West Virginia, which is one of our poorest states in Appalachia, they're developing these simulated workshops across the state that assign students roles to run the companies, but it includes punching a time clock. It even, it even has random drug testing. One of the biggest barriers to the manufacturers in the South finding uh, enough employees is getting enough who can pass the drug tests in the morning. And we have the, the maker spaces uh, is creating a whole op new opportunity for creating some multidisciplinary learning among students from the from the arts and manufacturing and the school-based business enterprises that are run by students. But they're running restaurants at schools, they're running shops, they have farms. They're creating fairly substantial businesses that actually operate in the market as well as just providing a learning opportunity. So this is, what do I think the future of work-based learning is in the U.S.? I think if it's gonna happen with the large businesses, it's gonna be a business by business thing. It's not gonna be a systematic. We'll have apprenticeships that are tailored to certain businesses. And for many years, we had what we call customized training, where the schools provide whatever kind of training the businesses wanted as an incentive to get them to locate there. Uh, but now, more and more, they're not looking for the kind of generic uh, skills, the uh, production line skills. They're looking for more highly, you know, higher technical skills. So I think that possibly we'll have a new form of customized training where the states will support or help, help uh, provide incentives to the businesses to, to buy into this custom, into the apprenticeship system. I think we'll have to have more collaborative arrangements for SMEs just because there's so many small and mid-sized businesses now in new industries that aren't organized at all to, for workforce le uh, learning. And they rely on, sort of, I think we'll have to rely on local and regional networks and alliances, uh, whether it's food-based, environmental, other emerging industries. We had a great example of that in the U.S. a few years back when uh, the pre-cluster days when everybody in Europe was looking at flexible manufacturing networks. And one of them that formed uh, and where I was working is the National Tooling and Machining Association. The president got excited about, uh, about the dual system and he created a network-based dual system where these students would have jobs where they would rotate among the companies in his a network of about 12 or 14 in different cities and they would have experiences with different owners in different environments and the businesses would agree not to hire them or not to compete for them until they graduated then they could they could have their competition they wouldn't try to hire them before they finished i think we're going to continue to have see greater dependency on the nash on the on the ngo as we call uh, nonprofits in the us and jobs for the future is just creating a whole new uh, center just on on apprenticeships right now, and it's setting it's 
being set up right now. It should be open in about a month. Um, and I think it's going to be especially, especially important for assisting immigrants and minority populations to get into this workforce development, getting into the workplace learning. And there's a number of examples in the South, the Foundation for the Mid-South, that's trying to match African-American students to businesses to give them the experience, but also make sure that they can go on to college. And I think we're going to have more diverse and varied short-term workforce experiences. We're not going to see a three- and four-year program. We're going to see more co-ops and internships, um, more focus on innovation, creativity, exposure to what we call in the federal legislation, learning all aspects of the industry so you understand the whole context in which you're working, not just the job that you're doing. Yeah, thank you. That's good. Thank you.